sounds good, doesn't it? It will also make you go weak in the knees because you see the RS457 is styled to follow the same design direction as the bigger RS models from Aprilia, the 660 and the V4. So design has got you covered. Even the engine has got you covered. It's a parallel twin motor. It's powerful, it's punchy. And all of this you get at a price that won't really break your super sport budget. So I think these bases are definitely covered. But you see, we have seen full-fed machines from other manufacturers as well. And there is now a trend where they look fast. They even go fast. But when it comes to the racetrack, they have those sloppy, relaxed, sport tour ergonomics. Charisma, RR310, Yamaha R3, even the Triumph Daytona 660. Damn you, Triumph. But does this follow the same direction? Or is it a proper track tool? We are here at the Kari Motor Speedway to find out just that. I mean, you saw the way it's attacking corners, right? This is a bike that's made in India. This is rolling on tires that are made in India, meaning you can buy them cheap. Meaning that you can come to a track like this, shred them to your heart's content and still you'll not need to get a personal loan to buy the next set. Believe me, that's a very, very important fact. A certain Lorenzo Salvadori probably heard that and even went around drawing circles and burning rubber. These are the TVS Eurogrip Pro Torque Extreme and they're really impressive. We've tried it before on other motorcycles as well, but here it just works so well. Like for example, there is three levels of traction control that you can choose from or you could completely turn it off. The traction control doesn't seem too intrusive, at least on the track. But we would like to see how it behaves on our dusty roads and in the wet, even with the electronics off. And Aprilia's MotoGP rider has been riding around this track with his elbow down on these very tyres. So, mortals like you and I should be good. So, if you do buy this bike as your first super sport, consider investing in a good track riding training program to make the most of this machine. Compared to some of its rivals that use a cheaper tubular terrace frame, the Aprilia uses an aluminium perimeter frame and that's one of the biggest highlights of how it's able to handle around the corners. Then you have this tank that looks large but under braking or while cornering it provides excellent grip and there is enough room even for taller riders to move around to get that proper body posture. So overall all of this comes together quite nicely to make this an excellent cornering tool. It doesn't fall or enter too sharply into a corner like say the KTM RC390 but at the same time it doesn't feel as lazy as something like the R3 or even for that matter the Kawasaki Ninja 400. It has a nice linear feel to it. The way it enters corners and then keeps on leaning, keeps on continuing to go closer to the ground. There's a nice linear feel to the whole thing and that will make it very accessible and very easy and very friendly for a lot of new riders. Once you master the braking aspect, which we'll come to in a bit, you can effortlessly carve a precise line through the corner. The nose dive remains subtle, yet under aggressive braking, the bike may exhibit a slight tendency to squirm. Despite the bike's track prowess, the suspension falls short in adjustability, limited to setting only the preload for both the front and the rear. In a sense, navigating swiftly on this motorcycle is a breeze, but there is a notable room for enhancement in the braking department. With the RS457, you get two levels of ABS. Either you get it on both the wheels or you can turn it off completely on the rear wheel. That was my choice, of course, for the racetrack. And also because, well, the brakes, they are not that great. They definitely need to do better braking there. The Vibre budget system from Brembo, it just fades a little too quickly on the racetrack. So the bike definitely deserves better braking hardware. You see, the ABS isn't too intrusive, but at the same time, the brakes, they lack feel, that there's no brake lever feel, they lack that confident bite that you want. And unfortunately, that is not happening. Some of you are also not going to like the fact that there's no IMU. So in turn, no cornering ABS. When you're trail braking into the corner, it can get a bit unnerving. It's all a part of the learning process, of course, but this bike definitely, definitely can do with better braking hardware. I hope Aprilia is taking note. If they don't, you as the owner definitely need to do something about it. I had to tap the rear brake often to shave speed and then even to stabilize the bike. The engine works its magic even around a tight 
circuit like the Kari. You can be in third and fourth gears all through these corners and still get an excellent drive out of it. And that's all down to the talky nature of the paddle twin motor. The punch of the engine lies in the mid-range, of course, and it's all really evident after 70 kilometers an hour and it continues to pull strongly all the way up to 160 kilometers an hour. At least that's the top speed that we saw here on the start finish straight of the Kari uh, before braking for the new C1 for the new layout of the Kari Motor Speedway. But this was in fifth gear. You should be able to easily ride past 170 in sixth gear. The engine definitely shows that promise. And this is before you start playing around with the engine, maybe modifying the gearing and all those kind of things. So the overall performance both in the mid-range and in the top end is really very strong. The engine's happy zone is between 5,000 to the 10,500 RPM redline. Even if the peak power comes at about 9,500, it still continues to pull. The power doesn't really taper off. But it gets to that red line really quickly. And sometimes it can catch you off guard again at a tight circuit like the Kari. And that is where the bike just begs for a quick shifter. I think it should have been offered by default. As of now, it's not being listed under the accessories list for India, but I hope they really open it up. And like I said, if it's a standard, nothing like it. But if it's not, if you're going to, uh, to come to the track or if you're going to be sport riding often, which you ideally should with a motorcycle like this, that quick shifter should be a good accessory to have. While appearing compact, the bike defies its size, striking a balance that offers a touch of that big bike feel without sacrificing agility in cornering. The thoughtfully concealed exhaust pipes evoke a reminiscent charm of the original RC390. Though certain plastics might lack a premium touch, I hope they resist buzzing or rattling over time. A common concern with such accessible supersport machines. Notably, the detailing on the handlebars or the well-laid instrumentation should divert attention from these concerns, and the ergonomically positioned controls enhance the overall experience. The RS truly distinguishes itself with a standout design, capable of attracting buyers solely on its aesthetic merits. The engine is pretty smooth and you're not really going to feel too many vibrations both in the handlebars or in the pegs. Now, if you look at the pegs closely, there are no feelers on them, but the pegs are placed in such a way that they offer you excellent cornering clearance uh, for the track. And when you're out on the road, there's excellent ground clearance as well, despite this being a super sport, in super sport terms, of course. What we couldn't gauge is the ride quality on public roads. It should be comparable to the Ninja 400, we think. The chassis is aluminium but the swing arm isn't. That is made in stainless steel, which means it is heavier, which means that the rear monoshock is going to have to do a lot more work. But nothing to complain about, at least in terms of the ride and the handling. That said, all this hardware, if it were to be used to make a 210457, that would be a tasty, naked, fast motorcycle, especially if you never want to come to the track or if you never wanted a full-fed super sport. Opting for stainless steel in the swing arm construction was a cost-effective choice, much like the brakes or certain plastics. However, it does contribute to added weight in the overall build. I'm 5 feet 8 and getting both my feet flat on the ground is not a problem at all. So seat height is covered. Now, in terms of the absolute weight, yes, if you look at the spec sheet, it isn't the lightest motorcycle around. But honestly, you don't really feel the weight in your wrists or in your knees, etc. Maneuvering this bike is absolutely easy, even in tight spaces, or even if you were to just move it on its wheels like the way I'm doing right now. Shouldn't be a problem. So tight parking spots, taking U-turns, riding in congested city environments, shouldn't be a worry at all. It has the best part weight ratio in the class though, and it shows on the track. It makes for a decent sport tourer too, but the pillion isn't going to be comfortable with that aggressive seating posture. If you want to go sport touring with the RS457, well, you can do that as well. Getting a comfortable riding posture or an easy riding posture is not too difficult. You can sit a bit upright if you want. So you can get that sport touring posture if you really like, though it is a proper committed track tool like this. In fact, it almost feels like it's a 250 and that's good news. Aprilias typically embody a compact size yet outpace their peers in speed. Currently, if I were in the market for this category, this Aprilia would be on the top of my list. However, it's worth noting that servicing and the maintenance costs might lean towards the pricier side compared to the Japanese or Austrian alternatives. So in conclusion, the RS457 is a very good blend of style, power and handling. 
and though it is pretty focused as a super sport, it still can be a good all-rounder in the hands of a seasoned, committed rider. But at the end of the day, it is not merely targeted at the seasoned riders, it is primarily targeted at the new rider. And from that perspective, I think it's priced quite well. I think it has enough performance to keep the newbie riders happy for longer. They'll not really feel that they have outgrown the power very quickly. There is a lot of potential, both in terms of the handling and also in terms of the engine. So they can actually be happy for longer before they upgrade to something bigger and with probably double the cylinders. But I think I'm pretty impressed with the motorcycle on my time on the track. Now, what remains to be seen is how good or bad is it out on the road. That is something that will happen closer to the deliveries which begin in March 2024.